Hi, this is Danny O with Hollywood Breakthrough, and today we have on the show John Russo from the movie Night of the Living Dead. He's actually the screenwriter, editor of the film, and here's a quick scene from the Night of the Living Dead. Welcome to a night of total terror. <laughs> Night of the living dead, the dead who live on living flesh, the dead whose haunted souls hunt the living, the living whose bodies are the only food for these ungodly creatures. <laughs> of the living dead. A bizarre adventure in fear. An experience in shock, more shattering than your strangest nightmare. <coughs> Night of the living dead. A night with the dead who cannot die. A night of total terror. Night. Of the living dead. John Russo from the movie Night of the Living Dead. He's actually the screenwriter, editor of the film. John, thank you, and welcome to the show. Well, glad to be here, Danielle. Thank you. Well, let me tell you. First, I love Night of the Living Dead. When I saw that as a child, I was truly thinking, zombies just coming to my house that weekend. <laughs> How old were you when you saw it? I was 10 when I saw it, and 10. I was scared <laughs> to death. Mm -hmm. I was scared to death, but I was in love as a kid for Mr. Dwayne Jones. Yeah. Uh, coolest guy. And actually, I really like how Judith was kind of like, that would be me panicking if zombies outside the door. <laughs> you mean the Barbara character? Yes. That went, you wouldn't go catatonic like she did, did you? No. <laughs> I think I would have been strictly panicked. Uh-huh. Well, she panicked for a while, then she gets smacked and she goes catatonic. But uh, the reason we did that was because we weren't sure we could get a young actress uh, good enough to 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 do more, you know, to to uh, to have a bigger role. Uh, because at, at that time, Pittsburgh had some pretty good actors and actresses, but they were mostly avocational. In other words, they had to take time off from their regular jobs or whatever in order to appear in TV commercials or uh, or, or uh, industrial films or any of those stuff that we normally did. And so carrying a major role in a feature film was, was going to take about 18, 20 days on camera. And who could we get that could that could afford that? And uh, so we kind of underwrote the port, uh, thinking, well, if we don't get an actress who's all that great, she won't have to do much if she goes catatonic. <laughs> and it ended up that uh, Judy O'Day was a pretty good actress, and she did a really good job, and we could have... Uh, uh, you know, we could have written a different kind of part for her. But as it stands, it worked out well, obviously. And the movie still thrills and excites people and is known as a, as a classic. So I guess most of the decisions we made were the right ones. And then uh, George Romero wrote the script for the Night of the Living Dead 1990, the remake, and he which I think was a good idea. He made the Barbara character 
a woman of the 90s, and she does, she is much more proactive in a lot of ways in that film. In 1968, this film just kind of, it was just a new type of film for that, that time. Uh-huh. How do you guys actually came up with that movie? How did it all came about? Well, it's kind of a long story. Um, you know, George and I were the two writers in our group at the time, and so we would discuss ideas, and he was working in uh, our editing rooms had typewriters, and so I'd work in my editing room, he'd work in his, and we'd compare notes from time to time. And I said, whatever we did ought to start in a cemetery, because people find cemeteries scary. And even in the Abbott and Costello films, which were comedies, but they were, you know, whenever they went um, to the, into the cemetery and unearthed Dracula or whatever, Bella Lugosi, then you know, it was still scary and funny at the same time. So um, we came up with an idea for for a uh, for a sort of a sci-fi comedy where where um, uh, alien teeny bop, teeny uh, teenagers from outer space bopping around the universe in their hot rod of a of a space vehicle, and they land on Earth and be, befriend the Earth kids, and now the Earth kids have these uh, extraterrestrial powers, and they're really pranking the little, little town that they're from. So it's almost like ET without before way before there was ET. But we couldn't, uh, we figured out pretty fast that we couldn't afford the, the uh, special effects of the space landing and all that stuff. I started out, then I changed concepts in midstream and I was working on something uh, where uh, aliens come to Earth in search of human flesh. And it started out with a kid that runs away from home and is uh, he's running through the woods or walking through the woods and crack he steps through a pane of glass that's embedded in the ground like 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 people plant hot house gardens like tomatoes under glass you know mm-hmm. but under glass is a cor- is a rotting corpse and these aliens uh, don't like um, you know they 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 like uh, the human flesh when it's rotted a little bit just like in the Middle Ages and, you know, people used to actually hang uh, game up to rot a little bit in the, before they ate it. So I was doing that, and then George King went away for a weekend and came back with part of the story, and it, had, it did start in a cemetery, and it, and it, uh, it, it uh, this girl was running from these creatures, and it was, it was like the first half of Night of the Living Dead, but in story form, not screenplay form, and and um, I said to George, well, this has all the right twists and turns, it's a suspense, but but who's chasing this girl, you don't say, and he said he didn't know, and I said, well, it seems to me they could be dead people, he said, well, that's good, and I said, well, what are they after, you don't say that either. He said he didn't know that, and I said, well, why don't we use my flesh-eating idea? So that's how they became dead people in search of human flesh, and without those two ideas, you really don't have Night of the Living Dead or anything that came after. So, and I took that, uh, you know, we beat around some more ideas, and then I took all that material and rewrote it and put it in screenplay form, and then I wrote the second half of the script myself. So that's basically the story of it. We did change a few things in shooting the film. In, in, the, first, in the draft that I wrote, the little girl in the basement isn't a little girl, it's a little boy, but Carl Hardman's daughter was available, so we made it, it, it from, changed it from Timmy to Karen. And um, things like that that we we changed. I see. But we didn't write it. We didn't rewrite. We just did it. Didn't make any difference anyway, whether it's a boy or a girl. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, how did you find the cast or the characters here? 
we started with people that we knew and we wanted, we didn't have much money, so we wanted to get people that could contribute more than money. So we had 10 people. Uh, it was, about, again, my idea to get 10 people together, our people that worked with us at our little company, and also closest friends and associates and get them to kick in 600 bucks each and we would have uh, $6,000 to start with. But, and then George got in the dumps because Russ figured, put some numbers together and figured we'd need at least 12,000, not six. And then George, George always got depressed and bummed out when things like that would happen. And I thought for a little while, I said, well, the first 10, we want, people that are going to work on the movie or act in it or do something important besides put up 600 bucks. The second 10 don't need to get as much stock for their money. Uh, they can get uh, the first 10 got six shares and the next 10 got only two shares. And as we went along, the price went up, you know, as we had something to show and we needed more money. So uh, that's what happened. So part the first 10 we talked to Carl Harmon and Marilyn Eastman because they had been in our commercials and industrial films. They could act as well as do other things. So um, we we got them in it, and they ended up playing uh, Harry and Helen Cooper. Russ got drafted to play Johnny, and um, most of us, Heisman was involved, and he he had worked with us on things, and he became the cemetery zombie, which at first I was going to do. Then he showed up, and but I did this one that got the tire iron through the head, and uh, the one that, I did the Molotov cocktail stunt. I got set on fire, and then in my old army uniform, I was the general's driver. So it was we were a a, a very tight knit production group by that time, and. And we had many talents and abilities that all had to be used to make that movie. And how did you find Judith and uh, Dwayne Jones? Uh, Dwayne Jones was, um, we, we thought maybe Rudy Ritchie, who was one of the first ten and a, and a friend and associate of ours, pretty close friend at that time, uh, He and he was a good actor. We thought he would play Ben. Uh, but then... Uh, George's girlfriend at the time, Betty, uh, was working in New York for a literary agent, and she knew Dwayne, and Dwayne was, was from the Pittsburgh area anyway. As he grew up in Duquesne, PA, right across the river, and uh, she she suggested, she said Dwayne was coming home for Easter to visit his family, and uh, we should audition him, so we did, and we thought he was the best actor and we cast him, which was very fortunate. <laughs> right. So and Judy O'Day uh Hardman knew and she was working in California and she came back and auditioned and she got that part. I see. So Dwayne, um, you know, we have close friends I mean, one of Russ's best friends who lives right across from him is Rufus Jordan, who's a black man who was the head negotiator for the Pittsburgh Teachers Federation. And uh, here, uh, when when uh, he and Russ met, whenever Russ moved there, I forget which one moved to that area first, but right across the street from each other and became friends. And here, Rufus has a whole room dedicated to Night of the Living Dead because it was such a source of pride for black people to have a, a, a Dwayne in the lead role and, and to do so well and to kind of break ground in that way where, you know, there were so many films where black people were, were uh, you know, the step and fetchets and they were lampoons and they weren't given the lead roles and all that. So I guess we did our little part to break that, uh, that ground. And, uh, and so, I mean, just like, uh, you know, the, the Italian people felt great when Sinatra became so big and, and Irish people felt good when, when, uh, 
John Kennedy was the first person of Irish descent to become a president, and and, right. and Obama too. You know, and all of that. You know, people uh, people need some way to take pride in the accomplishments of their own uh, race and all that. You know, I mean, which is just natural. So um, what happened? Dwayne and I became very good friends, and when he came back to Pittsburgh, we'd always get together and go to different parties and hang out and so on. His family was um, very literate, very well-educated. His sister was a Harvard Law School graduate, and uh, became, he, she was the city solicitor of Atlanta at the time of the Olympics down there. and. Uh, and their, and their mother lived with her, and I got in touch with them when we had the 25th anniversary convention, and uh, uh, and and so uh, that's the last time I talked to them. Uh, but later, Tim Ferranti, another friend of mine who wrote for Fangoria, he did the last interview with Dwayne when he was dying. Uh, so there's a lot of connections there, mm -hmm. and. Um, well, what more can I say about that? <laughs> well, you know, the film is so, what I was saying before, the film is so beyond. There's a couple points, though. The way you guys raise money was brilliant. Because you guys started basically in crowdfunding before crowdfunding was popular. Yeah, well, that, again, that, too, was my idea. I was the one that came up with the idea of making a movie. <laughs> because we had, and how to raise the money, and... uh so, um, yeah, and uh, and other filmmakers uh, followed in our footsteps. Spike Lee kind of annoyed me because basically we broke ground for him, and he came up and raised his money for she's going to have it in the same way we did, and yet he wouldn't give me an interview when I wanted to interview him for one of my books. <laughs> but neither would the Cone Brothers, too. They wouldn't give me an interview. Oliver Stone took time out while he was editing Wall Street, and I was writing my Making Movies book, I think, that one. And he gave me an interview, and those other guys wouldn't. So, to me, it was ridiculous. And you started, so, basically, you started that, that kind of, I to give money, and then mm -hmm. had people who want to be a part of the film to donate money and raise the, the actual funds each time a group of people come into the film. And that just yeah, we did it backwards. You know, we look, we didn't uh, say, well, you can be in this film if you give us money. We did it the opposite way. It was like, well, who, who can we ask to come into this partnership that has talent and might kick up a kick in a small amount of money? So. Uh, now there's a lot of uh, well, you know, give me some money and I'll put you in a movie. Mm -hmm. We didn't quite do it that way. Right. I think the way you guys did it was uh, better because I think you got a great talent of cast out of it. Plus the film itself, budget was like, honestly, I think the $114,000. Well, that's what it came to after we, we, you know, we paid bonuses. And once the film started to make some money, we paid bonuses to people and, uh, and so on, but it was we we had it in the can on about sixty thousand bucks, but we did that by selling a little bit of stock. I think we only sold about twenty two thousand dollars worth of stock to about thirty shareholders, and uh, and we ran up our lab bills and uh, our credit cards and everything we could do to. Uh, pay for the film and later on Eddie Murphy did that same thing did his I forget what the movie was but he did it on his credit cards and so on mm -hmm. and everything was shot in your hometown well it, the farmhouse was 30 miles from, about 30 miles from Pittsburgh because that's where the farmhouse was and the, it, you know that was the major element that we needed is some kind of house we could destroy and that was a tough row to hoe for us. But a guy that uh, was Jack Ligo, uh, an intern, knew about the farmhouse. 
and it was going to be bulldozed to make make a sod farm and uh so we were able to rent it for 300 bucks a month and do anything we wanted to it and then it was bulldozed when when the movie was shot and the, it had no basement so we did the basement the, ba the basement was the basement of the building we were in in Pit downtown pittsburgh and um Hard, Hard, Carl Hardman's studio was, uh, they did radio spots and radio production at that time, so they had a, that was the TV studio. And uh, then we went to Washington, D.C., went down there, shot the Washington, D.C. scene in one day and drove back. And that, too, was my idea because we wanted to, you know, how can we show that uh, that this is happening all around the United States, not just in this little uh, place. Uh, and so I said, well, Washington, D.C. is only about five hours away. Let's go there and shoot. So we used Carl Hardman's. He collected antique cars. He had a few of them. His car became the general's car. I called all around and found his funky general's uniform that was the best I could get. You know, it, but in black and white, it works. And, um, and I, I became the driver. George Romero is a reporter in that scene, and Russ shot it because George and I were both in the scene and couldn't shoot it. So, you know, that kind of thing. But we all, like Russ and I did a lot of camera work, too. I shot a lot of the stuff that's on the television. Mm -hmm. So when I wasn't being George's assistant cameraman on the 35 millimeter camera, then I was shooting 16 millimeter stuff. And then when we did explosions or anything critical, we shot, uh, George would shoot in 35 millimeter and J Russ and I would use uh, 16 millimeter cameras that we had and uh, just to cover it. So. You know, you get the picture. It's a very cooperative effort all the way around. Right. And what type of cameras you guys use for this film? Well, we used an Aeroflex 35 millimeter camera and an 85 pound, 80 pound blimp. Very awkward and not very maneuverable, but almost. I mean, ho most Hollywood movies were shot on that kind of camera at that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the quality was excellent, but you know, and the uh, the only the reason we use 16 because the stuff was going to be matted into the television anyway. So we figured that the graininess of a 16 millimeter mat would it would look like it would look like the you know the reduction in quality that would happen when something was on a TV screen. So I mean now there's no reduction if you have a HD television, you know, but then. You know, the television image wasn't as sharp as for, as a 35 mil. It just worked to do it that way. Right. Also, the movie is actually is in the, it was registered in the Library of Congress, preserved for the National Film Registry? Yeah. Yeah, we made the top 100, too, of all films, all films, not just horror films. And usually, as far as horror films are concerned, we're ranked right up near the top or at the top. So, mm -hmm. so it was very unusual to be a horror film ranking at the top there. Yeah, we're about number seventy-nine or something like that. Now, you're the writer of this film. Was it hard to come up in the actual film when you were doing the editing? Did you take a lot of things out the film that you felt like should have been stayed in the film, or did you make some compromise? No. We didn't we didn't have a lot of things to take out or put in. You know, we shot we shot it on a six to one ratio in like Woody Allen or Scorsese and them. They shoot twenty five or thirty to one. They shoot everything and dump it on a editor. I mean it's not that simple, but some directors are that way. They don't really know blocking and film and pacing and film screen direction is so well so they shoot everything and dump it on an editor we have to edit in our minds and know pretty much what we're going to use you know and and that's george a lot of times just winging it and shooting getting one take on things because 
we were running out of film and you know luckily you know, we were all good enough to make it work so the one thing the basement scene i really didn't know why george shot it all <laughs> it's pretty bad uh, the the um the i mean the Carl and Marilyn rewrote the scene and added in a lot of lines for themselves. And uh, if I were directing, I wouldn't have shot it. It was a big waste of time. And uh, and so uh, uh, two and a half minutes, or I chopped out two and a half minutes of it. The distributor wanted it out, and there was no way to cut. So I, I put a jump cut in there, and I figured I'd rather have a jump cut than have this garbage in here. And um, Later, when we did the 30th anniversary edition, Bill Heisman actually found a way to fix the edit, fix the jump cut. Oh, okay. So, so it was fixed then. But, um, you know, I mean, there are things like that. We fixed a lot of things. Like in the original film, if whenever Ben drags the body of the lady upstairs, Mm -hmm. He she's wrapped in a he wraps her in a carpet and drags her down the hall. Right. Uh, you can actually that was Kyra, <laughs> d d doubling as the dead lady. You can actually see her face that it's not all chewed up. We fixed that. We just cut into it later, and uh, we what else? We fixed the jump cut. We had to shorten the bad body of the film, and we shortened Judy O'Day's speech, which was too long, and so we cut it, and it works better. So there are a lot of things we did with the 30th anniversary edition, and it gets criticized by all the nuts that think I don't have the right to mess with our own film, with our own film. <laughs> but I wrote a prologue and an epilogue and didn't hardly mess with them, just you know, which is the surest way not to mess with the body of the film. Mm -hmm. And so we did a prologue and an epilogue, and we didn't shorten the, 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 the main body of the film very much at all. Wow. Also, I was wondering, too, at the end of the film, the way the, I guess, the hunters are coming in, the sheriffs are coming at the end, and the way uh -huh. they kind of confuse Ben as a zombie, how that kind of worked out because how the ending of the movie, I was just kind of thinking there's, I just didn't know it was going to end the way it ended. I thought it was going to be like a sequel or something else coming. Well, uh, again, we were running out of film, running out of time and everything else. So the, the, yeah, I said to George, uh, you yeah, know, we have to go back to Evan City. We have to shoot Ben getting shot and we have to, come up with some idea for closing credits. It was my idea to shoot Ben, too, because I said Pennsylvania is a big deer hunting state, and every year three or 400,000 deer are shot and 10 or 1,200, so it would be ironic if our hero was shot by accident. And so, you know, we did want to shock people. We wanted to be true to the concept and all that, so we did you know, shoot them. That was in the first draft of the script, but the girl survived. Mm -hmm. You know, they both make it down to the basement, and and um, and then he goes up when he hears the helicopters, and he gets shot by accident. And then the sheriff and the deputy come in and work their way down into the basement, and they see they're about to shoot Barbara when they, but then they see a tear rolling down her face, and shows them that she's human. So the last scene was Ben's body being carried out to the bonfire in the background, and she's huddled in that um, trench coat, and somebody's trying to get her to take some coffee or something. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then somebody it wasn't, I don't think it was me that came up with the idea of, why don't we bring Johnny back, and we did that. So then, she, you know, that, that we changed that part, had her dragged out by Johnny. Let's see what I was I driving at. So anyway, I said, as far as closing credit, I said to George, I said, we won't have to order more film if we do the closing credits on stills. And why don't we do a freeze frame when Ben's shot? And then and then we there was a movie called Failsafe that 
in, where the New York City is going to be bombed by the Russians because we accidentally bombed one of their cities, Moscow. So you, you had the closing of the film was all these people looking up at the sky and freeze frames on them, and they're all you know they're all going to die. So I said, why don't we do something similar, maybe – take stills of the posse members and all that and Dwayne's body being uh, hooked by these, you know, these, 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 uh, these hook type things, meat hooks and the, and, and end the film that way. So I went, George Cassana and I played the sheriff. We went into Evan city and bought uh, wooden, ro wooden rods and st steel rods. And we actually made the hooks and then we and we shot the stills, shot all that sequence once with stills, which Carl Hardman shot, and then Carl and Mer uh, printed them through ch different layers of cheesecloth so we could pick what looked the best, and then gave them the stuff to design the closing sequence with the animation shop, and that's how that all got done. Wow. So it's just creative thinking and then having the ability to pull it off, the knowledge to be able to do it. So uh, it worked very well. And, 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 you know, and then it just comes to life again when the torch is lit. So that's just all you know, a bunch of creative people working. And a lot of it is just problem solving. Just with Night of the Living Dead, but any film or any creative enterprise, it's uh, being logical and solving problems. There's a lot of Night of the Living Dead types of movies out. Mm -hmm. Kids of the Corn, Night of the Dead. There's so many other films that kind of took what you did or tried to do something at a twist to it. What do you think about how those other quote-unquote, living dead types of films out there right now? Well, I say, you know, don't rip us off, but uh, if you do something new and original and bring something new to the party, then that's fine with me. So I don't usually see them. I haven't watched even one episode of Walking Dead. I don't want to be influenced by other people's ideas, and I don't want to have to wonder if I have a certain idea, would I have had it if I hadn't seen somebody else's thing? Sometimes when that thread is passed, then I'll watch them. So, um, you know, I watched 28 Days Later because I had a workshop. We were using uh, Canon XL1 cameras. And I wanted to see what the blow-up looked like. So I saw that movie, and I thought it was pretty good down to the last half hour when it kind of got stupid. <laughs> but I thought... Uh, um, Shaun of the Dead was funny. I thought I saw Sam Raimi. Well, I interviewed Sam Raimi a long time ago, so I had to see uh, The Evil Dead, and I said, this is a really talented guy, and you could kind of tell he was going to go pretty far in the business, and he had a great energy. So I saw that, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of them that are good and uh, and, uh, and do in our original, so that's fine with me. I don't have any quarrel in it. I don't care whether the zombies are fast or slow, just so there's a logic to it. If you make it work, more power to you. Right, right. And then there's a lot of stupid stuff, so <laughs> that's life. Right. Now, you said you, you did some projects, too. I know you have some projects you're doing. Uh, well, Russ Streiner and I, we just finished, uh, we're, we're uh, co-producing and co-directing a Civil War documentary, and uh, we uh, the, we had to do the pilot on it, so we just finished the first 18 minutes of it. It looks great. It's a lot of fun. It's a really, I think, important film that may be a TV series. It's called... Uh, uh, the overall title of the series is American Towns at, at War, and then it focuses on Falmouth, Virginia, and Brookfield, Pennsylvania, 1861 to 1865, town against town. So, I mean, the the idea is that the, the Civil War wasn't fought by one nation against another. It was fought, won, and lost by America's small towns. 
Atlanta at that time only had 20,000 people. And so it deals with the sacrifices and the triumphs and the tragedies of, of these small towns north and south. And it focuses on Falmouth, Virginia and, and uh, Brookville because Falmouth was occupied by over 120,000 Union troops through most of the war beca because it was only 60 miles from Washington, D.C. and about 60 miles from Richmond, which was the capital of the Confederacy. So it had to be occupied and fought over in the in the Fredericksburg right across the river was the scene of big battles and then troops from from Brookville uh fought down there and uh and the Brookville was a key stop on the Underground Railroad for escaped slaves to help them escape. So a lot of tie ins we focus on uh, and I'm saying a lot about this they uh, I think it's great. They, uh, uh, there's a private Craig, and we have his memoirs, and he was, he enlisted as a private, uh, fought down there, uh, was wounded several times, and uh, ended up a captain, and he was one of the troops that escorted Lincoln's casket after he was assassinated. So a lot of tie-ins between Brookville and Falmouth are two very good towns to use to illustrate this proposition. And, and America has no shortage of wars, unfortunately. <laughs> no shortage of small towns that were affected by them, so we think it can be a TV series. And now we have to raise the rest of the money for the to finish out this film because it's probably going to be 45 minutes to an hour long or longer. And it 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 doesn't. We thought we filmed reenactments, but it's not about reenactments. You need some of that to convey the context of the film. But there's a, um, you know, there's a section on a fellow named Moncure Conway. Most people never heard of him, but he was the South's leading abolitionist and got disowned by his family and all that stuff, and then. He went to England, and he was highly instrumental in keeping uh, England out of the war because the, the Confederacy, because of the dependency of England on cotton, they wanted England to come into the war on the side of the Confederacy. And then we have a section, a section on, uh, we deal with women and children and their role, North and South, and what they had to survive during during this war. In, in the, and then there's a section on the black troops, which 186,000 uh, black men fought in the Civil War, and um, in their, and they won an enormous number, something like 19 Congressional Medals of Honor, which people need to know about these things. Right. So that I'm trying to think what the other what another section. Well, we are going to focus on on Private Craig, and we are going to focus on in another section on Moncure Conway and the in the, that kind of thing, and then the section on the women and children. Well, anyway, you get the picture on that. It's I think a you know really important film because of the battles have been done to death, and uh, you know, but I probably mentioned a couple things right just now that you didn't know about. I bet. No, I didn't. I had no idea. Um, that that film seemed like it could be very interesting to see. But what about funding? How are you guys going to do traditional crowdfunding, or are you going to do something a little bit different to raise? Well, we have we have uh, we're working with the Brookfield Chamber of Commerce and the and not Chamber of Commerce Historical Society and the Falmouth Historical Society and the key mo startup money the 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 uh, Historical Society, they have connections. They actually got money for the first part from Walmart. Hmm. Okay. So we think once they see the um, uh, pilot, they're going to probably come up with the money to finish the film. But either through them or through the gov you know, the state governments and things like that. So we don't have to raise the money. That in this case, it's. The historical societies are doing that. Okay, okay. Now you teach class too at the university. Are you still doing that? 
Well, we have a we're, we have a program at a business college called Du Bois Business College in Pennsylvania, and our students um, have won uh, prizes in the 48-hour film project six years in a row. Different classes too, not the same class, oh. and they're doing really great work. And we're trying to build the program, which is a little toughy. We think it's the best and least expensive program in the nation. And you know, and it's only like three thousand bucks a, a term, and there's six terms, so the whole course is like twenty-two thousand bucks. But you, you have to take general education courses as well as movie making. So you get a, um, it's fully accredited and you licensed and you get a, 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 a liberal arts degree. So that's transferable to other colleges. So it's pretty good. It's a really good program. We're going to do some workshops. We're setting up to do some online programs and, and workshops too. So, and of course, we're raising money for my remake of my movie Midnight and a couple in my Escape of the Living Dead, which is hung up by a by a Hollywood company, much to my chagrin. So it hasn't been greenlighted yet. And then I have another script uh, called Spawn of the Dead, and that's being agented. So. I always have uh, six or eight projects going at once. I have a new book that came out in October called The Hungry Dead, a follow-up to Undead. And um, Hungry Dead has the Escape of the Living Dead novel in the trade paperback along with a a reprint of my novel Midnight. So, And then I just signed a deal with for publication of a uh, book I wrote that's a total different thing. It's called Dealey Plaza, and it deals with um, people go down, uh, people leave a college, they leave Belmont University in New York, which is a fictional university, but they want to film their own reenactment of the Kennedy assassination because they're conspiracy buffs, and on the way home, four of them are brutally raped and murdered. and that that book covers 40 years of American history and, uh, uh, you know, all the different uh, – because the premise is that Dealey Plaza and the assassination of John Kennedy made, made a change in America that it changed this country forever. And, um, and just like Tom Brokaw said that – you know, we were in a different country after those shots rang out in Dallas, and that's that's the premise of this book, and that's what this one guy, we all wanted to become a writer, but he goes on a crusade to get justice for his friends that were murdered and becomes a, an FBI agent in an anti-terrorist unit, and he pursues these killers, which are, you know, white supremacists. And he pursues them and other terrorists down through the years until, until you get to, uh, uh, you know, 40 years after the murders, all these, the same people or the survivors of that trip are at a college reunion and the, and the snipers there waiting to kill them all. So we don't know who's going to live or die, but it's all connected back to that, to that first batch of murders. So, anyway, that is that's that. That is really great. You so you're doing a lot of different things, and you also have a, I think you have a comic book. Um, was it also you did with? Adam? Well, Escape of the Living Dead. That's what gets pisses me off that they they um, you know they bought this script in Stonebrook Entertainment, and I'm supposed to direct it, and they were they were going to shoot right away. Well, right away was about five years ago now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yet the uh the screenplay was turned into a five part comic right away. We made the top ten nationally and it spawned two graphic novels and ten sequels. And um and I have uh Christina Klebe and Gunnar Hansen and uh Tony Todd and uh you know the Tom Savini and I have all this great cast 
and they haven't green lighted it. And I think they spent their money and they're, I think they're hurting and all. They won't give the rights back. So that's, that's, uh, that's what happened with it. So the comic book, people can purchase the comic books, but for the actual film for the Escape of the Living Dead, that's okay. Yeah, they could probably get the graphic novel still. I think the comics may have sold out or it might be down to broken sets now, but I'm not sure. But the publisher is Avatar, and they could get in touch with Avatar and um, and see what they can still buy. Now, what do you tell some of your students about how to go about to, I guess, the top five things you think every film student should know about the industry? About the industry? You know, doing it our way, we have to know everything. A lot of people, like like I watched, um, you know, the Alec Baldwin movie, uh, Seduced and Abandoned. Mm -hmm. Weird title, but it's it's a good documentary about Alec Baldwin and his producer going to the Cannes Film Festival to try to raise $50 million for a movie they want to do. And they're, I mean... We know most of the stuff that they talk about and they don't because they go out there and then they do one thing or one specialty or they're kind of hired guns and it just sometimes amazes famous people that we meet when they see how much we know that they do not know, you know, just structuring deals and um, the, just the, the whole inner workings of the business and uh and contracts and negotiations and marketing and merchandise deals and every other kind of thing that uh, that uh, if if you that we've had to do on our own and we also constantly learn about that kind of stuff because because Night of the Living Dead has gone on for all these years and Russ and I are the ones that negotiate and all the new deals. So then we have to keep dealing with it. We have to do all this, and we have to know how to do it. So, by the way, the Night of the Living Dead Live, the stage play, uh, just won five awards in the uh, uh, Toronto uh, Toronto Broadway Awards. Oh, wow. That's so, fantastic. Yeah, we've got, and, uh, you know, things like Les Mis, they're in that competition, too. Mm -hmm. And we got, they won some awards, but we got, we got uh, best director of a play, best actress in a play, best actor in a play, best ensemble cast, and best play. Oh wow, that's great! So that just happened a couple of days ago, and you can go to Night of the Living Dead Live uh, dot com, and you can see uh, uh, get information from there. That's great. And if someone wants to do the studying, uh, I guess go to the university and do work with you at the university. Is there a website for that university or the college? Yeah, dbcollege.com. D is in Dave, B is in boy, dbcollege.com. And you can see me and Russ talking about the program and you can see some student work. And a lot of our student work gets posted on YouTube too. And the, but my website, go to my website, uh, johnrussoentertainment.com. I don't have links set up there, but I have information about where you can, how you can book me and where my merchandise is available, which is mostly on eBay now for sale on eBay. Well, I got one of yours in person when you came. Um, yeah, thanks. I got the screen. Uh, I bought the actual um, screenwriting uh, script here. I'm number 518, so I'm very excited. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So definitely. Well, I appreciate you buying that. Yeah, that was fun when I was at Webster University, and I'm going to do more of that stuff, kind of stuff, too. Yeah, it was great uh, meeting you. You have a wealth of knowledge, and a lot of people definitely can learn a lot from you. So definitely want to make sure you're out. We, we meet you out and tour and support all your work you're doing. And just kind of keep. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate it, Daniel. Your film, I tell you, personally, The Night of the Living Dead, meant so much to me growing up. It was probably my. I've seen other scary movies, but this one stayed with me for pretty much as an adult because I. 
I loved it so much and I was so touched by it, mm-hmm. so afraid that I just kept watching it. And even now, I still watch the film because I love it well, that much. We hear that all over the place. And one of the things I really got a kick out of is I. I uh, was a special guest of Kirk Hammett, in, uh, who's the lead guitarist of Metallica, and he, he's been a horror fan and a horror and a collector of horror memorabilia and stuff, uh, for most of his life. It's been especially, he got to where he can afford a lot of stuff, for sure. And, uh, but at the Orion Festival in Detroit, I was there, and, had a blast because when you're there and you get the VIP treatment and get to see this, everything from the you know the sound checks on through and a hundred thousand people <laughs> you know it was uh, fabulous and then they uh, I got along well with uh, them and they invited me to uh, uh, this was something I've been tweeting and promoting on my website and my, my Facebook page and I have I have a Facebook fan page too and um, the Twitter and all that I've been promoting Fear Fest Evil <laughs> and I'm a special guest there in San Francisco okay so that, I'm really looking forward to that because it was so much fun before and the Kirk is so gracious and such a warm gracious person and so I met Robert who a um bass guitarist. I haven't met Lars or uh, or James yet, but I'll meet them there, I think. But they, because the thing was so spread out, and they, each band member had, like, like James collects classic cars. He must have had 100 classic cars in his tent. Kirk's was all horror. When I say tent, those tents are as big as a house. You know, they're not just little things. Oh, okay. They're major things with corridors and chambers and everything. And then uh, Lars is, collects classical paint, classic paintings, and he just sold a painting for a hundred million bucks. So just pretty fascinating. We get to do things that other people don't, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is part of the fun of what we do. And, uh, and that was one of the major things that I enjoyed. And you, you, you'll be doing some more, hopefully doing more tours. So I would like to definitely bring you back to St. Louis to do another event because Light Living Dead, just, and just talking about your work itself. And a lot of people, those dumb students and self in general can just learn so much from you. Well, thank you. So we try. So I want to say thank you for coming on Hollywood Breakthrough Show. We'll have all the links of everything, the information for a show, uh, the show notes for you, so people can look up the information. And it's twisted. okay, great for doing this. All right, thank you. Thank you.